It is such an honor to be here with you all this morning. If you do not know who I am, my name is Jake Antizana. I have the absolute honor and privilege of being our youth pastor here at Emmanuel. As my kids over there, there's about six of them who woke up in time to be here um, today. I say that every time, but there's more than six. Maybe there's exactly six. I'm not sure. Um, but before we jump in, I just wanted to honor our pastor, Pastor Mark. How many of y'all put love Pastor Mark? Come on, y'all. I mean, homie, homie looked good in his little, his little suit jacket last week, you know what I'm saying? Looked all sharp, got the hair all cut. Um, but no, I love Pastor Mark, and um, I love this series that we're in behind closed doors, and I know we're just starting it, um, and today we're going to be jumping into week two, but I'm so thankful for, for Pastor Mark, his leadership, um, and really just all the staff here. Um, y'all, y'all saw Noah up here, you'll, you'll see um, media, media volunteers, media staff. Um, we have an awesome team here at Emmanuel, and I, and I get to witness it every single week. So um, can we give it up just for our staff and our pastor again? So listen, they gave me a time limit this week, so I got to be quick. All right, that's why I'm jumping into it. That's why I'm excited. Um, but we are in week two of our sermon series called Behind Closed Doors. Okay, behind closed doors. And so the, the title of my message this morning is simply this. Y'all are coming to church. Maybe y'all been coming to church for many, many years. Maybe you've been, maybe you're in, uh, you're that, the, the veteran Christian in here. You've, you've, you've got your stuff set for 60 years. Maybe this is your first week back to church as a follower of Jesus. Whatever your range is in that spectrum, I want you to know that today is for you. Today is for you. But something that a pastor said, so I always feel like I have to say it because they are wiser than I am. They always say, your expectation of today determines your revelation of today. What you expect to get from today will be what you get from today. If you are here today just to check off a box off of your to-do list on a Sunday, off of your religious to-do list, then that is what you will get today. Just another box to check. You're going to run out of ink of that pen soon, okay? But if you're here to expect new revelation from God, new revelation from the Holy Spirit, then that is what you will get. Cool? Cool. Title of the message is How to Follow Jesus. Some of you are already ready to get up and walk. Don't walk out yet, okay? Give me a chance. Before we get into the scripture today, I want to share a story with you um, about my first <laughs> beneficial job in my life. Um, so I went to Salisbury University um, from the years 2013 to 2017. I graduated in 2017. Um, I played football all, all four years. Um, and in the summers for football, we stay to lift and be with the team, build team chemistry, camaraderie, all that stuff. Um, but in order to stay in Salisbury, you needed to get a job, okay? Because you can't just live, you know, without having money. Um, and actually, the people I lived with, they're actually here today. They're awesome. The shorts, they are one of my favorite, some of my favorite people on the, on the planet. Um, they, they house me. They love me. They treat me like family. I love you guys. So you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about where I'm going with this. But in the summers and then during the year, I worked for Salisbury's maintenance department, okay? So Pastor Mark's not very good, like he, he admits it, right? He's not very good with his hands. I'm like, okay, like I can figure it out. And do you know what me figuring it out is? It's called YouTube.com, okay, for most things. But for me to figure it out, I also had to have some experience. I had to have some exposure to things. And so I worked um, in the summer at the maintenance department. When I, when I applied for the job, they were like, hey, you're going to be with this plumber, um, and you're going to be like working on all the plumbing throughout the campus. And deep down, I was like, that sounds awful. That sounds terrible. And so I show up to work, and there's actually, I think, two to three students, because it's a lot of student workers at the maintenance department, um, that were assigned to the same plumber. So they're like, hey, this guy, he does not need three helpers or two helpers. So we're actually going to reassign you to um, this guy. His name's Mr. Ed. Now, Mr. Ed was known infamously in the building as someone who was difficult to work with. Okay? So Mr. Ed, if you're watching, it gets better. Okay? This is what people said about you. Okay, I didn't say it. I didn't know you. But, but we, we, I end up working with Mr. Ed, and, and what I find is that Mr. Ed is simply just set in his ways. It's, it's not a bad thing. And at first, it seems like not really a good thing, but as you spend more time with Mr. Ed, you understand why he does what he does. And so Mr. Ed was an electrician who had been in his craft for probably 40 plus years. My guy could probably um, put a ballast up and put all the wires together with his eyes closed, with the power on. <laughs> but here's the thing, 
Mr. Ed would not do that because he had systems and routines in place for his safety and people who were watching him and, and benefiting from his product's safety. He was always thinking about everybody else whenever he did anything. So I got to work with Mr. Ed and I got to experience what it looked like to be an electrician for the summer and then eventually for the next two and a half to three years, I worked with Mr. Ed. And during this time, I got to see that yes, Mr. Ed may be set in his ways, and this is how Mr. Ed walked. Are you ready? You got me camera, whatever? Ready, this is how he walked. If you passed him, get back here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. If you're too far behind him, would you hurry up? Yes, sir. I'm coming right away. So Mr. Ed was set in his ways even into the way that he walked. But the beautiful thing about Mr. Ed is that he, he not only used me as like uh, somebody who would get supplies from the truck, but he actually taught me hands-on things doing this electrical work. And the beautiful thing about learning under somebody who has so much experience is that you learn things that you can use for the rest of your life. So Mr. Ed, one day we were working in a breaker box panel. Y'all know what that is? Okay, so if you unscrew the breaker box panel, you take off that huge metal sheet. It's there for a reason. Don't unscrew it. We had to work a lot in this way to turn off the master power to the building so that we could work in there. And he looked at me and he said, Jake, do you see that breaker box panel? I said, yes, sir. He said, you see those uh, things that look like giant screws or giant uh, nuts uh, in in that box? I said, yes. He said, if you touch that, you will die. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) Yes, sir. He said, so when I tell you to do something or to not do something or to freeze or to move, you must do what I say when I say it. Because he had so much experience, because he had so much knowledge, he was able to tell me what was right, what was wrong, what kept me safe, and everything in between. Mr. Ed taught me things that I use still to this day. He taught me how to safely electric or uh, safely wire up some things in my house. You see, we pulled wire, we put in receptacles, we changed light fixtures, we did everything that you think would happen, everything that you would need at a campus, or, uh, I'm sorry, a college campus, every electrical thing on that place we worked in. Now, there are some things that I will not do because I've heard stories about people getting shocked, and now I've had my fair share of shockings, okay? Just because I watched somebody who's a master doesn't mean that I'm a master, you know, you know what I'm saying? Cool. All right, so let's jump in. Oh, goodness. <laughs> there, there's a little, uh, it's a little puppet in here. I think, ah, you know, so. All right, Luke chapter four. <laughs> y'all got to stay with me this morning. I got to keep y'all awake. It's the Sunday after Easter. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my goodness. There's something, 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 something. All right, good. Luke chapter four, verses one through 13 reads like this. I read from the um, New Living Translation, if you guys are following along, so your version may say, something a little different, but it'll be on our beautiful Sky Bible on the screens. So it reads like this. Right after Jesus was baptized, this is what happened to him. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. So Jesus ate nothing all that time and became very hungry, okay? Let me just talk to you all real quick. During my, my challenge, 75 hard, I intermittent fasted for like 16 hours and I was, I was, I was struggling. Jesus went 40 days. Some of y'all can't go four hours, you know what I'm saying? So, including me. So then the devil said to him, this is where the temptation starts. If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. Now, I'll listen, I just got to stop, okay? Have y'all ever smelled bread when you're hungry? It smells like heaven. I, I, don't ima- I don't know what heaven actually smells like, but I'd imagine it smells like a bakery when you're 40 days hungry, okay? Carly and I went to, my wife and I went to Starbucks yesterday. We drove by the window to get our drive through little cold brews, you know? And we drove by, I said, man, that smells good. She's like, what do you think it is? I said, it's probably the pastries. It smells so good. And a mixture of pastries and coffees. That's just a little aside. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. <laughs> Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. See, I got to stop because this, this, is, this is rich. Y'all see, Jesus is getting tempted immediately. Now, some of y'all who came here last week who maybe accepted Jesus for the first time, this might have been one of your hardest weeks of your entire life. 
Because did you know that when you follow Jesus, not everything gets easier right away, but you do have a different perspective of hope in your life now? Sometimes the devil sees a little baby seed and he wants to kill it in baby form. So he will use anything and everything to get to you, especially the thing that appeals to your desires and your flesh the most. For Jesus in this time, he said, no, 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 no. Man does not live by bread alone. So Jesus starts to use scripture. But here's the thing about the enemy is he is not a dummy. He is cunning and he is manipulative and he is a twister of words. He is a liar, but he is a very good liar. So then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. You see, Jesus, I will give it, to you, it all to you if you will worship me. Jesus said, look, that sounds good and all, because I'm hungry and I'm tired and I could really use a shower. But this is what Jesus responds to him and says, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord, your God, and serve only him. Here's the thing that sticks out to me in this, all, all these temptations. Jesus never looks at the devil and says to him, no, you can't do that. No, that wouldn't feel good right now. No, that, that wouldn't be pleasing to me right now. You see, Jesus is meeting a temptation with a truth. So, so before I get too carried away, because that's not what we're talking about either. Holy Spirit is just coming in this place, okay? But listen, the devil said, you know what? Maybe I got to fight fire with fire. Or maybe I got to pull out my sword too. So the devil said, okay, that didn't work either. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say in the book of Psalms, it doesn't say in the book of Psalms, but in your context, in your notes, it'll say that. He will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your, hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded to the scripture that, this, that the enemy, the devil used. He said, that's true, but the scriptures also say this. You must not test the Lord your God. When the devil had finished tempting him, uh, Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. The first thing I want to talk to you about today is this, is that practice makes prepared. Practice makes prepared. My wife uh, spoke at One Youth a few times ago, and she, that was one of her points. I said, oh, that's good. I'm going to use that one day. Today is one day, so thank you, Carly. Practice makes prepared. And the beautiful thing I love about this, 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 this passage is that it's very, it's right at the beginning of the book of Luke, but this is at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. So scholars would guess that he's somewhere between the ages of 29 to 33. And by scholars, I mean the, the amount of research I did on google.com. So you can look it up too, okay? So Jesus was in, uh, around the age of 30 when he started his ministry. So right when he was baptized, he came up full of the Holy Spirit. And right after he was full of the Holy Spirit, the enemy came and tempted him. But here's the thing that I think we miss or we skip over a lot of the times is that we actually hear a little bit about Jesus' life in the other Gospels of the New Testament. We hear about Jesus, obviously he's born, the little drummer boy's playing, bump, 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 bump. The baby's trying to sleep, Mary's angry at the little drummer boy. She's like, listen, it's nap time. We can play Coco Melon later. And the little drummer boy's just going crazy, okay? Um, look, if somebody came to my house and they're loud during nap time, I'm gonna talk to them outside, okay? Like, listen, it's time for you to go home. <laughs> you know, little drummer boy, you take your whole band, y'all, I know you travel a long way time for you to go. So we see Jesus as a baby, but then we also see Jesus when he is a, 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 young, a young man, maybe around the years, ages of 12, maybe 10 to 15, around that time, where Mary and Joseph are traveling with him, and they lose him in the crowd, and they end up finding him in the synagogue, and Mary's freaking out. She's like, Jesus, where have you been? This is all PJV, Pastor Jake version. I'm, I'm abbreviating and kind of going into the story a bit. And he said, don't you know that I was in my father's house? Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you expect that I'd be here? Where else would I be? And then you don't hear from Jesus for 18 years. He's in timeout, okay? He's in timeout. He got, he got grounded for 18 years. I'm joking, of course, because you know, y'all know Jesus honored his mother. Come on. Y'all know Jesus honored Joseph because he was fully man and fully God. But the reality of it is, is you don't see Jesus for another 18-ish years. 
So what happened in the 18 years of Jesus' life? Can I tell you what happens? Jesus practices to be prepared for what he was sent on earth to do. He was sent on earth not only to, of course, to die for our sins and, and be raised to life again, but he was also sent to show that no matter what comes against us, we can overcome. Because we serve a God who came down and was wrapped in, in fleshly clothes, who was fully man and fully God at the same time, and who conquered everything. They offered him Chick-fil-A in the desert after 40 days. Come on, y'all. That waffle fry is looking extra nice. Y'all ain't had Chick-fil-A since yesterday. Y'all, y'all mouth salivating. You're conditioned to Polynesian sauce. I just see it. I need to stop talking about food. Because last time I talked about food, a lot of people went to Buffalo Wild. Like I talked about Buffalo Wild Wings last time. A lot of people went there. I was like, guys, we're not sponsored by them. Don't give them your business. Like, you know, go to the East store. <laughs> okay. We don't have food at the East store, but okay. But here's the thing is that in the Jewish culture, Jesus' next 18 years-ish, a lot of his um, uh, childhood, he spent, this is is really cool, he spent learning every single scripture that existed. That was the culture of the time. um, There's a name for the schooling that they were in, but by the age of 12, you had to memorize, I believe it was the Pentateuch, which is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I believe that's what you had to memorize by the age of 12. If you could recite the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible by that time, then you could advance to the next thing, which I guess you would like, our our culture today maybe would classify that as college and then into, into, I'm sorry, high school and then into college. And then once you memorize, or and then once you get into that high school kind of um, education range, they require you to memorize the entire Old Testament, okay? So when Jesus was being tempted by the enemy, What he did was he recited to the enemy what he practiced for so many years. So you see, in order to follow Jesus, you have to understand that you have to practice how Jesus practiced. And you have to prepare how Jesus prepared. So how did Jesus practice? How did Jesus prepare? We're going to get to a little bit more of it in a second. But Jesus spent time in the Word. Can I ask you a question, Emmanuel Church? When is the last time you spent time in God's Word? And you took five verses and you said to God, God, would you reveal something new to me in these five verses? It's just a question. Because if I'm being real and vulnerable with you, sometimes it's difficult for me to be disciplined enough to open my word as, as, a, as a young man because I feel like I have responsibilities and I, have, I, I am busy. I have a 16, almost 17-month-old daughter. And so I feel consumed. I feel tired. I feel distracted. I feel like I can get my dopamine hits from somewhere else where it's easy and it's fast if I just open my phone and I scroll through a couple of videos on TikTok. It's a little bit easier for me to feel full of something that doesn't actually give me any energy or, um, or any ammunition for the future. But you see, Jesus practiced so much that when the temptation came, Jesus said, I know that comes from the book of Psalms, but did you know that there is also another scripture that says, don't test or tempt the Lord your God? You see, there there is temptation and then there's truth that we have to fight the temptation with. My question for you is this, what truth do you know that when the temptation comes, what are you fighting with? Because, can I challenge you with this? If you're fighting with your feelings, if you're, fighting with, if you're fighting with your emotions, you will only win for so long. You are bound to lose if you are fighting with your feelings. Practice makes prepared. And here's the thing about Jesus. He didn't just go through the schooling. He didn't just come on Sundays at 9 o'clock and check off his box. He didn't just go to small group on Wednesday nights and say, got my small group done. He didn't, listen, listen, this is, this is even the thing, right? This is, I'm, I'm challenging y'all, and I'm challenging y'all because I'm challenging myself. This is something God has been, has been convicting me of. He said, Jake, do you even know me? He's saying, Jake, do you even know my word? Are you able to fight the temptations that come in your life with the truth that's in my word? Because if, if you are, then maybe, maybe things will start to shift. Maybe things will start to change a little bit more in your life. Because some of us open up our Bible app and we go through our plan and we read it real quick and we go through the scripture. And I know some of y'all, y'all don't even read all the scriptures that they put in the, in the daily Bible plans. I've read this before, check, you know. 
But Jesus spent intentional time because he knew the author of the words didn't just put them there just to put them there. He knew that they had power and that they had meaning. So what am I trying to say? Jesus knew his word. Do you? We are Christ followers. We are mirrors. If that's a word, Google it later. We are supposed to mirror our master. Christian is someone who is Christ-like. Are you actually like Christ? Or are you like your idea of Christ? Are you, are you like your Americanized version of Jesus? Or are you like the Jesus of the Old Testament and the New? Or the God of the Old and the New? Just a question. And I know I'm coming in hot, I know I'm coming in firing. But this is truth that God revealed to me. He asked me the same questions. He said, Jake, I know you do your devos, brother, but what did you get? Now, sometimes you don't get anything. I, get, I know that. Sometimes, sometimes you read the book of Numbers, and they're like, there was 35 pencils and 45 beams of wood, and that stuff, I'm sure somebody's getting something out of that. But for me, it may be not that. But there is that, that question. What are you doing with what's in your hands? And the beautiful thing about Jesus is that he was becoming someone instead of doing something. This is the beautiful part about being an apprentice, about being a disciple of Jesus, is that we are not prone to and we do not rely on religious things. Coming to church, it is a religious thing, but your expectation when you come to church, that's a relational thing. If I go to my mom's house and I sit on the couch and I'm on my phone for an hour and a half and I have the TV on and I'm watching March Madness and I never say a word to my mom, I never converse with my mama and I get up and leave after an hour and a half. I might, I'm 28 years old, I might still get a spanking, okay? But some of us do that when we come to church, wouldn't you agree? We come and we're just like just checking a box. Or we open our word and we're just like, just check in a box. Or we go to small group and we're just like, just check in a box. Now, all those things are good things, but what, what your spirit is like when you do those things matters. What you expect when you're at those places matters. You see, Jesus, when he was reading the scriptures and memorizing them, he wasn't just like, God, I, got, I got Genesis done. Oh, I got Exodus done. Oh, I just memorized all of Proverbs. I just memorized Psalms. I just read about the story of King David. He's not just reading just to read. He's reading and soaking it in and meditating on it and spending time with it and saying, God, thank you for all of this. Because I love, can I tell you all why I love the Old Testament? Then I'll move on. Because in the Old Testament, you see the character of God the Father. And you know, the cool thing about God is that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he does not change. You get to experience your creator in the Old Testament. You get to see the promise of God the Son, which was to come. And then you get to see the fulfillment of everything in the New, in the New Testament. The Bible is so rich. How to follow Jesus? Get in your word. Practice makes prepared. P M prepared. So here's the thing, what you practice in private is what is prepared for everyone that you meet in public, okay? What is prepared in private is also, I'm sorry, what is practiced in private is what is prepared for people in public. I feel like I'm talking to my daughter up, up, trying to get her to say P. She loves saying mama, I won't say dada, okay? I'm venting to you guys, sorry, it's not my therapy session right now. But we have to understand that everything we do in private is always displayed in public. People, people will say in the church, I talked to a couple of our campus pastors about this this week. It's like, yeah, man. Not, they weren't saying it, it's just people say, yeah, man, you can't pour from an empty cup. Can I tell you something, church? Your cup is never empty. It's not. My question for you is this, what is your cup full of? Because what your cup is full of is what people will receive from you. Your impatience, your intolerance, your anger. But on the other side, your joy, your patience, your peace. What you're full of is what people get. And some of y'all might be full of some other stuff, you know what I'm saying? But that's, that's, for, that's for Sunday after church, maybe in the parking lot, okay? 
Pastor Marshall be like, you can't speak again, okay? So. <laughs> so now that we've established the importance of practicing, it's important to practice because things always come against us, things always challenge us. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, things always come against you and challenge you. So practicing is important. So let's move on to the idea of starting the right practices. Second thing is this, we are formed by our patterns and also in the same breath, our patterns form us. So a lot of times, let me give you, let me give you a quick story. So I, I just finished this challenge, well not finished, I guess I'm still technically in the middle of it, but the initial challenge is called 75 hard, okay? 75 hard is a fitness challenge um, and um, mental strength challenge where you have tasks that you must complete daily, okay? Your, your task list is available from 12 a.m. at the beginning of the day until 11.59 p.m. at the end of the day. So every single day you must have two workouts. One must be outside, 45 minutes each. You must stick to a diet. You must drink one whole gallon of water. You must uh, read 10 nonfiction pages. If you want to learn the rest of them, you can look it up. But just to give you a brief overview of 75 Heart. The thing about this challenge was that I was not living my life in a way that was conducive to 75 hard. It did not mesh well with 75 hard. But I was asked by some of our staff uh, in the Salisbury camp, so like, hey, you wanna do this challenge? I was like, no, but yes. And people asked me at the beginning, they're like, Jake, what's your why? What's your why, why do you wanna do it? I was like, I wanna do it just to say that I did it. That's it. And so we started, and so I went from living whatever kind of undisciplined way I wanted to on that Sunday. It was the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and so that Monday after Thanksgiving, we started this challenge. And I remember going through it in the first two weeks were very difficult because I was like, I got to fit 90 minutes of working out into my day. Oh, and then we, I got to stick to a diet during Christmas time. Oh, and then, oh, it's, it's pouring rain. When I come back on a trip from California— and I'm kind of jet lagged, which I don't really, I still don't understand that. I, I do, but I don't, you know. But like, I'm kind of jet lagged and it's pouring rain and I don't have a picture. But, but I remember walking that walk 45 minutes after I've been traveling all day. Absolutely miserable. Came back soaking wet, looked like a little puppy. And my, my wife took my picture. But the thing that I, I loved about this 75 hard challenge is that it set new patterns in my life that said, also part of the challenge is if you miss one of them every single day, you have to restart from day one. So if you're on day 75 and you don't drink your gallon of water by 11.59 p.m., you lose. It's, it's, it sounds way worse than it is. It's, it's not too bad to do if you get your pattern set. But the thing that I learned about this is that in this checklist, I'm very task list, I'm very task oriented in my life, and maybe some of you guys are too. But it helped me stay accountable. It helped me stay disciplined in what I was doing. Um, And I learned, even though maybe I I had already known it, is that you got to do it even when you don't feel like doing it. Now, can I tell you something? Maybe you know, especially if you're a veteran. When you're following Jesus, a lot of times it's easier to not follow Jesus. Because our flesh is not always willing. The spirit is, but our flesh is not. The flesh wants to do what it wants to do. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, you don't want to say Psalms 91, 45 to 7. You, you want to say another word and wave to them with part of your hand. There are things that you want to do because your flesh is, is it's offended. There was this one time, I'm getting so distracted. There was one time I went, to, I went to Walmart, right? I was picking up some supplies for a youth rally that we had. And I, I got this awesome parking spot. I was pulling in, and this guy backed out, and I'm going the right way. Y'all know Walmart, they got the right way and the wrong way. And it's at, right at the front. I was like, God, you blessed me today. And I was pulling up, and the guy backs out, so I got to wait for him. And as soon as he backs out, some homie pulls in. Urch! <laughs> I thought about that dude. I, saw, I still see his face. I thought about that dude the rest of the day into the weekend. I said, how dare he? That is, that is my parking spot. I was, I'm even going the right way. I'm following the law. And so God, God convicted me. He said, how important do you think you are, brother? 
I said, well, apparently not that important because that guy took my parking spot. So, you know, sometimes I converse with God. I'm like, you know, that was wrong, right? He's like, yeah, I, I know, but he literally broke the rules, but it's fine. <laughs> Anyways, back to our patterns. The patterns that were set by my challenge, I had to follow in order to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. My why was I want to beat this thing because I've seen a lot of people try and fail. And I want to do something that a lot of people can't do. And so following Jesus a lot of times is the same way. We, we, we need to do things that people cannot do. We need to do things that people won't do. Following Jesus is not something that is for everybody. It is hard. It is difficult. It is a lot of sacrifice of self-desire and self-want. But the question is this, is how do I get my patterns in, to form me in a good way? Because you, don't, you may not realize it now, you are formed by your patterns that you have set in your life right now. For me, my pattern is this, is that my daughter sometimes takes two naps a day, sometimes takes one. But during that two or one nap kind of part of my day, I feel like a free man. I mean, I could, I could run for president right now. I, I, let's, let's, get, let's get it going. Let, you you want to go exercise? And then she wakes up, and then, and, and then my pattern is back to being a dad, and I, and I love it. But, but that's my pattern right now. But some of us have other patterns in our life. Maybe, 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 maybe oh, I don't want to go there. Should I go? Yeah, I'm going to go there. Maybe, maybe it's, it's baseball on the weekends. Maybe, maybe it's travel baseball on the weekends, so much so that you're so much in the pattern during the spring and the summer that the pattern actually bleeds into the fall, into the winter, and then into the next spring and the summer. And so your pattern on the weekends is that you don't even come to church anymore. Maybe your pattern is that you, you have zero dollars in your bank account because you can't get over your rise up addiction. Listen, I love me some good rise up. Best coffee I ever had in my life. But that joker is expensive. Listen, I used to go there during college, I used to have really good prices, but they spiked them after COVID. So, tough, but you know. But some of us have patterns in our life. Maybe, maybe we're sucked into toxic relationships because the pattern in our life is that that's how I feel affirmed. The attention I get from the toxic relationship makes me feel like I belong somewhere. At least they're talking to me. At least they're saying something to me. But the patterns that you allow to happen in your life form you over time. Let me prove it to you. All ready? Romans 12, chapter two, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 reads like this, New Living Translation. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Another way to say that, don't follow the patterns that are set everywhere you look. Stop looking at the news for the way that you should think. Stop looking at Instagram or social media for the way that you should view things or view people. Stop it. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Some other versions say renewing your mind. But not just doing it once, doing it every single day. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here's the thing I want to talk to you about real quick. What is so important about changing the way that you think? What's so important about it? What you think about, what you dwell on, is who you become. Right? We talk about that a lot here at Emmanuel, but, uh, and I always bring it up, but it always starts in your thought pro patterns, always th starts in your thought processes, and then it bleeds down to your emotions and, and the things that you desire to do, and what you desire to do, you eventually do. But can I maybe bring it to some science as well? Listen, I'm a communications major from Salisbury University. I have a minor in athletic coaching. This is not from Dr. Jake. But this is from a book called Winning the War in Your Mind by Craig Groeschel. It's a quote about our brain. Y'all ready? The brain is a command center that directs the parts of your body through neurons. Neurons link together to create messages. The same message sent multiple times will create a neural pathway. The presence of a neural pathway makes a thought easier to think and makes it easier for your body to send that same ma uh, message again. Our brains always default to autopilot because it requires the least amount of energy or focus to do. 
Maybe you're sitting here wondering, why do I keep doing the same thing over and over and over again? It's because there is science backing what is happening in your head. When you leave church, you always go to the same restaurant. Why? Because church triggers memories. Memories trigger neurons. Neurons trigger the rut that your brain follows and the thing that you are stuck in. Now, neural pathways or quote unquote ruts that we live in are not always bad things, but sometimes they are. Our bodies crave familiarity. That is why our brains create neural pathways. But let me ask you this, if our bodies and our brains crave familiarity, what are you creating familiarity with? What is it? Because sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's just okay, sometimes it's good, but it's not always God. But for some of us, we've created familiarity or ruts with things that don't feed our soul. For some of us, a rut that's been created is ever since COVID, you've been watching online. And it's created a routine, it's created a pattern for you in your life. Now listen, I know that we have people who are watching online. My God, Robert, Robert, if you're watching, man, I love you. Uh, you are so missed in building, but there are some people who just can't come. But there are some people who have a neural pathway in their life that say it's easier for me just to watch church online so that I can go about doing my day as I see fit. So I never give God my undistracted time with his people. Instead, I'm yelling at my kids who are running around, even as Pastor Jake speaks this, as I'm making a peanut butter jelly sandwich and somebody just threw a glass of milk through the window. But because COVID, it's crazy, y'all. It's, it's been three years, two, four years, four, four years since COVID happened. People are still stuck in the pattern that COVID created for them in their life. Why don't, why don't we start to take back control and start to take back things that, that God says are good for us? Why do, you, why do we forsake the gathering of believers? Maybe it's been COVID. Maybe it's been social media that's gotten you in a pattern of thinking that your worth comes from the amount of likes, of notifications, of views that come in for anything that you post. What if it's a failed relationship after a failed relationship that has had your brain default to settling for the way that people treat you just because you get attention and just because it feels good when somebody's texting you back or calling you or whatever it is. What if the rut that we're in is actually harmful, not even just to our soul, but maybe even to our physically, physical bodies? So whatever it is, your brain loves ruts. Your body loves ruts. Why? Because it's comfortable. We are formed by our patterns. But here's the thing I learned from the God of the Old Testament is that in the middle of your desert, you feel stuck. You feel like, what, God, what are you trying to do? You're still trying to eat what Pastor Mark spoke about on Easter Sunday. You're still trying to eat what Pastor Mark spoke about on the, on the you come on every second and fourth Sunday. You're still trying to eat what Pastor Mark talked about two weeks ago. The thing about God that I learned from the Israelites in the desert is that we cannot rely on what God told us yesterday. Yes, that can be good and that can be a promise for the future, but if I'm constantly looking back on what I ate seven days ago, and I don't ever eat again, I'm going to look like, if we talk about physical, you're gonna look physically malnourished. You will have no energy for his kingdom. You will have no energy to love people well or to treat people well. So what I'm trying to tell you today is this church is that you need new manna every single day. So we talk about the word, right? Practice makes prepared, but here's the thing also, is that you're formed by your patterns, but if your patterns are having you rely on, on what you ate four weeks ago, or maybe you only come on Christmas and Easter. I love what somebody said about Christmas and Easter. Christians, y'all know what they call them? They call them CEOs. That sounds really important. But it's Christmas and Easter onlys. That's my new favorite word. They used to say Christmas. I like Christmas and Easter only. That's way, it sounds, you sound like up here, you know? But you are. Because if you came back after Easter, this is not to, to slight you or to slander you. What I'm telling you is that there must be things that you practice every single day which bring you closer to the presence of God. There must be new manna every day. You know what happened to the manna that the Israelites tried to save in their tents? Nasty maggots. It got stale. You could not consume it even if you try. And guess what? If you ate it, you would get sick. There must be new manna every day. God has new fresh revelation for you every single day. Your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Sunday, they are not the same. 
We, we un- have to understand we are formed by our patterns that our patterns form us. So let's get back to the, to the, to the man. We, we see Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. We see how his patterns help formed him in the desert. And then you see it throughout his whole life. He, you see him interact with people and love people. One of my favorite things about Jesus is that he was never in a hurry to leave a conversation with somebody. And we live in, an, in, in, a, in a corporate America where somebody's too busy. We have to make an appointment for somebody. Now, listen, I know that there are, are structures in place and all that. But we live in a place and in, in a society where people are too important to talk, even converse with somebody. Where in the, in, in the life of Jesus' three years do we ever see him not have time for someone? Children would come up to him, and his disciples were like, no, we, no, 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 not right now. Jesus said, let them come. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. He said, listen, when the kids come, why can't you have faith like them? And some people think childlike faith, I read this in a book, it's so good. Some people think childlike faith is just believing anything you hear. What if childlike faith is living in simplicity? What if childlike faith is doing the same thing over and over and over again. God, I'm so thankful for Aria. When, when, I, when I had Aria, I started to understand a little bit more about how God felt about me. Aria. This is so dumb, I don't want to cry. She has this book she loves to read. It's called Good Night Gorilla. <laughs> it's a dumb book. <laughs> it doesn't even have any words, it's not even fun to read. I have to make up my own story every time I read it to her. And she'll, she'll look at it, and she'll pick it out from the bookshelf. She'll say, Dad. Or not, she won't. She doesn't say, Dad, like I told you guys before. I'm still going, you know, still dealing with that. So. Um, but she'll bring it to me, and she'll go, ah. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay, I know you want to read that book. So she'll sit in my lap, and we'll read it. And I make up a different story every time. Or I'll be like, oh, the monkey stole the keys. The, oh, sorry, the gorilla stole the keys. And she'll, she loves it. And I wonder if sometimes in our life we're too busy and our faith is too busy because our patterns have sped up. What if childlike faith isn't just to believe everything that you hear, but what if childlike faith is just to live in simplicity and to do the same thing over and over and over again with your father? Because in those moments, I get to see the growth of my daughter. I get to see her point to things. And I say, Aria, point to the lion, and she'll point to the lion. Aria, point to the elephant, and she'll point to the mouse. <laughs> no, she knows the elephant. But I get to see her progress and I get to see her mature. But I love Jesus. Because at the beginning we get to see, yeah, worship team, y'all can come out. Sorry, I'm, I'm ending here. We get to see Jesus from the beginning of his ministry until the end from Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. The last point is this, go and be. Go and be. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples, which is go and do, right? Maybe like sometimes we, we think a lot of, a lot of uh, following Jesus is going and doing things. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And at this point, Jesus was leaving his Holy Spirit behind to be with his disciples. We see Jesus get the Holy Spirit at baptism as he comes out and goes into the wilderness. And as he leaves, he leaves the Holy Spirit here. Holy Spirit is still, still here to, to this day. He is living on the inside of each of us. Y'all know when you're, you want to say something and the Holy Spirit says no, he catches your tongue. He said, oh, that's probably not good to say. Don't say that. It happens to me way more than it should. Oh, oh, you, oh, you're going to post that on Facebook? Are you sure? Put that, yep, look, delete, backspace, highlight, copy, or cut, whatever, it's gone. Delete. Holy Spirit is still here today. Jesus gave us commands to go and to do. Russ, you can come out. But we also must go and be. You see, you see becoming someone is the goal, not doing something. Because growing up, if I'm admitting this, Following Jesus for me was a doing thing. I must do this in order to follow Jesus. But here's the thing. Or here's my question before I really, really end. Are we becoming an apprentice of Jesus? Or are we becoming an apprentice of our idea of Jesus? So here's the thing about being dis- disciplined in our patterns. Just like I was disciplined in 75 hard, I completed my tasks every single day. A derivative of the word disciplined is disciple. 
Jesus had 12 disciples who followed him, who, who, who did what, what he said, who did what, what uh, who practiced what he did. We cannot just have dreams or visions for our life. Dreams or visions or emotions can only take you so far. Me and my mentor, Paul, we talk about it often. Sometimes people come to church and you have an emotional experience. The real change in your life does not happen through emotional experiences on a Sunday. Now listen, you can come and you can hoop and holler and get all excited because Jesus did something in your life. I know he did. There are people in this building, I know your stories. But if all that we do is get emotionally excited on a Sunday and we never do anything from Monday through Saturday, what are we doing? We're living in a religious cycle every single day. You see, we call Jesus our Lord, but do we act like it? Do we call Jesus our God, but do we treat him like it? Because when the Lord tells us if you to do something in the medieval times, you don't do it, you get sentenced to death or you get kicked off the property. Thank God we have a gracious God who says, I know you didn't do it, but I give you another chance and another chance. But we have to go and we must become something because behind closed doors is where breakthrough starts. We get so excited on a Sunday. We get so excited when somebody motivates me or makes me feel good. But the change happens. Y'all know, listen to this. I, I lost 30 pounds on 75 hard. But on day 32, when I was struggling, nobody celebrated me. But I didn't need it because I was disciplined. In your life as a Christian, God is trying to develop something in you on day 32, on day 47. This is a constant walk. Stop quitting. There is transformation power in Jesus, in God. But we can't just experience it on a Sunday. You have to make a decision to be. Become someone, become something. Don't just do it. Take it, apply it, meditate on it. Why is this important? Because being someone is tied with identity. Doing something is tied with your works or your ability. What happens when your doing is not good enough? We must become like Jesus. Jesus did not want Peter, James, and John to simply just walk around and touch people and say, we're praying for you. Oh, got to give some money over here. That's just good. He said, don't just go and do. He said, go and be. But Jesus did not want you to do. He wanted you to become. Jesus knew what it took because it all started for him in obscurity. It all started for him behind closed doors. You want your life to change? Change your habits behind closed doors. You want your life to change? Start to pick up good habits behind closed doors. Would you guys pray with me as we close out? God, I just thank you. God, I pray that this word would stick. God, I pray that, God, for Jake and Tizana, this is a work for me in my life. This is something that you're convicting me of, God, something I'm progressing in. It's not something I am perfect in by any means. God, from the ages of 10 to the oldest person in this room, God, you know. God, maybe our patterns that are set, maybe they've seemed to work for so long, but I pray that we would be sensitive to things that you're trying to reveal to us in our life, that we would not be so stuck in our doing that we would constantly look to become more like Jesus. God, because I am not perfect yet, and I never will be, but God, Jesus set the perfect example for us to strive for. And I pray that, God, as we go out this week, that if we're frustrated or, or we're, we're upset or things are difficult, God, that we would not look at it as God forsaking us maybe we would ask God, what are you trying to teach me through this moment? God, we thank you for your word. It never comes back void. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name.
Everybody said. Thank you so much for watching our video. If you guys are interested in any more content, make sure to click on these videos right here. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you'd like to check out our website, you can do so in the link in the description. Thanks for watching, everybody.